Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of our annual year-end Jewish retrospective round table. Once again, I'm joined by a wonderful panel who will be sharing their perspectives on many of the issues and events of significance to the Jewish people, the State of Israel, in 2017. Let me reintroduce them to you once again. Stephen Baim is the director of the American Jewish Committee's Kuppelman Institute on American Jewish-Israeli Relations, and Steve is a frequent lecturer throughout America on issues relating to Israel and American Jewish life. And I'm happy to say you can see many of those lectures here on JBS. Eric Yaffe is President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism, which he headed for some 25 years. Eric is now a widely read columnist who can be read in Haaretz, the Huffington Post, and online at ericyaffe.com. Eric is also a frequent rabbinic scholar in residence in Jewish communities throughout America. Elia Abadi was the founding rabbi of one of the most dynamic and successful Sephardic synagogues in America, the Safra Synagogue in Manhattan. Currently, Eli is the rabbi of a new Sephardic synagogue in New York, Sharei Mizrach, and heads the Sephardic Academy of Manhattan. In addition to being a rabbi, Dr. Eli Abadi is also a practicing gastroenterologist in New York City. And as always, we're joined by Thane Rosenbaum, award-winning author whose novels include Secondhand Smoke, The Golems of Gotham, and his most recent novel, How Sweet It Is, about Jewish life in Miami Beach in 1972. Thane is also a senior fellow at NYU Law School, and he is the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, and his op-ed pieces and book reviews appear in major secular and Jewish publications. Gentlemen, thank you once again for joining me to discuss 2017. Uh, our first program, we really spent the entire program discussing the uh, failed compromise and the implications of Orthodox power in the state of Israel. Ellie, you also chose, as the most important event from your perspective, Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And in many ways, there are people who feel that is the most significant event. Eric, you interestingly enough, said that you thought the most important Jewish event of 2017 was the inauguration <coughs> of Donald Trump and the implications that have had for the Jewish community here in America. And in Israel. And in Israel. And then, uh, thing you talked about the Taylor Force Act. Taylor Force Act, which you then had a chance to speak about a little bit. We'll see if people want to comment on that as well. But, Ellie, I do want to begin with you. Um, I want you to again summarize for anybody who may not have seen part one. Why of all the events in 2017 did you choose that one as the most significant? Well, because I think is almost at the level of the Balfour Declaration at the level of the United Nations Partition Plan of the 29th of November 1947, and also of Har President Harry Truman's recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. What will it do? What will it do? What it will do, it will make it once and for all clear to the rest of the world that Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel, was the capital of ancient Israel, and there is no need anymore to live this life with a mask, with the eyes closed, and ignoring the fact that it's a, a reality on the ground. Okay. And it will also make sure that never again will any president can reverse that, that denomination, that, uh, that uh, decision, because by law, of the Jerusalem Embassy Act of Congress, that made it into a law that cap the Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and the embassy of the United States shall be there. Okay. Thane, the decision by Donald Trump was received, it was a firestorm that came out of it, that, very controversial. What, first of all, what's your sense of it, and how do you respond to Ellie saying it's the most important Jewish event of 2017? 
I actually think it's the most important Palestinian event. I feel it very differently about this. I don't disagree with Ellie, but I actually don't care about the rest of the world. I only care about the Palestinians. I think anything that reads them the riot act, that Israel isn't going anywhere, that their delusions about Haifa and Tel Aviv one day being a Palestinian state, these things need to be rebutted. This is the problem that they don't come to the negotiating table. This is the reason why they really don't believe in a two-state solution, because they simply believe in a one-state solution, a Palestinian state without Jews. Uh, that's what it means to sing songs from the river to the sea. When you sing a song like that, it's a genocidal song. I've said this on the show before. We don't take them seriously enough. When people sing songs we should take seriously, take a look at the lyric of the song. Why are they singing that? They're singing that, and the reason they don't come to the negotiating table is because they're living in a fantasy. And the fantasy, by the, war, by the way, was perpetuated by Barack Obama, which is with resolution, UN Resolution 2334 and the United States' failure to veto that. So say, look, the real problem is the Israelis. Uh, UNESCO, the Israelis have no real connection to the land. <laughs> you know, it's the, they're, the Israelis are a white colonialist power. They have nothing to do with this part of the world. And I just think that, that what the, I think it's only symbolic. We talked about this on your show a week ago. I don't actually think the effect of it, as Ellie just said, Congress in 1995 had already passed a legislation indicating that Israel, the capital of Israel, was going to be Jerusalem. So in some ways, lawfully, we've only been working off these six-month extensions to delay the actual move of the embassy. And guess what, Mark? We're still not even moving it. He passed another six-month delay. So again, it's only symbolic, but what I think is important in the aftermath of the, of the Obama administration, uh, any time that the Palestinians are being reminded in the most declarative, forceful way, Israel's not going anywhere. That is not your country. You might have some country, but you're going to have to accept what that is. I know that's difficult for you, which is why you've walked away from those two discussions five or six times in the past, but that's your country, and stop looking elsewhere. And you know how we know it's their country? It's is that at least Western Jerusalem is going to, going to be their capital. So that's the significance of that. In terms of the firestorm, I think what's interesting about the last week since the announcement is how little a firestorm there is. Uh, the days of rage, ooh, wow, the, what days of rage? Unfortunately, there were two Israeli pe uh, policemen that were killed. But the, 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 the response generally throughout the Arab world has been tepid, largely unremarkable. And again, the good news, right? And this is, it feeds into the foreign policy establishment. It feeds into the w people who were in the Obama administration, this days of rage, as if Arab populations in the world should be dictating what our foreign policy is. I mean, imagine if the Icelandic people, oh, days of rage among the you know, Icelandic people. It's only in that part of the world that we literally say without any sense of shame to say, we would not make a decision because they might burn a flag of ours, or they might say death to the Pope, or death to British novelists, or death to Israel, big Satan, little Satan. You know, we shouldn't capitulate to this kind of extortion. And so this fear, this fear, we, again, was perpetuated by a foreign policy establishment that has always taken the position, it's Israel's fault. And I think the one thing that came out of this Trump administration decision Again, symbolic alone, but still not insignificant is, at least in this White House, we don't think it's their fault alone, for sure. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? <coughs> well, following up on, on Thane's remarks, um, in terms of the reaction, this was another example to me of uh, Abba Eben's dictum that the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. What they could have done, instead of promising violence and days of rage, they could have said, we're disappointed that the president did not say anything about the capital of a future Palestinian state being in East Jerusalem. That would have scored enormous points internationally and would have demonstrated some sense of we're looking forward to a Palestinian state. They didn't do that. To some extent, uh, following Thane's remarks, it's uh, another illustration that um, they're more interested in the destruction of Israel than they are in the attainment of Palestinian national sovereignty. I think a second reason it's important, going beyond Thane, is that um, the eight years of Obama, because of his style and tone, perhaps more so than the substance of his policies, it suggested a diminution of the U.S.-Israel special relationship. 
It's as if Obama's mode of operation was America has no special friends, we only have special interests. The fact that Trump did this was a reaffirmation of those ties. It was a boost to Israeli morale. It's interesting, it's my third point, but um, <clears throat> whereas American Jewry was sorely divided over this issue, uh, AJC did a poll back in September <clears throat> that indicated only 16% of American Jews thought the embassy should be moved now and 36% said at a later point. 48% basically said it should not be moved. In Israel, <clears throat> every political party, with the exception of Meretz and the joint Arab list, applauded Trump's move. What they essentially were saying was that the embassy belongs in Jerusalem, and a statement by the United States to that effect would be, would be welcome. The reason I, d I disagree that um, it's not on the level of Balfour in 1917 or the UN in 1947, <clears throat> is that beyond those items, it doesn't really change the realities on the ground. The capital was Jerusalem. That's where government was, was working its offices. The whole world didn't know that, whether they were willing to admit it or not. So that the, um, the move itself does not change history, per se. And uh, as opposed to what I said l last time, that June 25th does. It did change the facts on the ground. This was a move that the embassy belonged there, and the president was right to assert that. But it doesn't really change an awful lot. Are you glad he did it? <clears throat> I applauded it. AJC applauded it. Okay. Um. All right. Three people sort of <laughs> like it. What about you? I like it. I supported it. I thought it was a wise move. Uh, I've written about it. Mm. Um, I, I agree with what I think with uh, the thrust of what Steve was saying. I thought it was a rather modest move. I think we've exaggerated its importance. Uh, let's reiterate. Uh, all the talk was about moving the embassy. He did not move the embassy. Not only did he not move the embassy, everything that was said about when the embassy would be moved was very ambiguous and equivocal. Is it going to be moved in six months or in a year or in two years or in four years? We don't have any idea. And uh, let's well, also... Well, Tillerson now says three years. We'll see. We'll see. Um, he could have moved the embassy <coughs> on the day that he made the speech. A number of people made this point. Mort Klein, in this case, was, are you, are you was saying absolutely it in right. A critical fashion. My own view is why, why not? Uh, uh, yes. All right. I'm I'm being a little <coughs> bit critical here. He could have taken a sign and and put it on the doorknob of an apartment anywhere in West Jerusalem and said, this is the embassy, and, and, the, em and the embassy would have been moved, and, and, so, and so why not do that? And you would have rather he do that? I would have rather he do that, um, because, I mean, mm -hmm. at, look, what he was doing, as, as we've noticed, he was saying that the capital of, of Israel is in West Jerusalem. That was what he was doing. What he was not doing, and if he was mm -hmm. going to do that, he should have done, he should have simply made the move. Um, what he was not doing, let's be clear, he was not uh, saying that he supported a united Jerusalem. That's a correct. He, he yeah. was not saying... That's but correct. he didn't say West Jerusalem either. No. He just he said made, Jerusalem. No, he it he made clear. it very clear, and in the statements that followed by his spokespeople, he was not saying a single sovereignty. Correct. You know, so the, the people on the right who, you know, agreed to this with exhilaration, I found it to be bizarre. I mean, look, it is important... Uh, uh, for there to be uh, American recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's a reality. It's been the case, you know, since Ben-Gurion. But nonetheless, it's important to me, uh, viscerally and politically, to have the President of the United S uh, States say it. But beyond that, he didn't say or do very much. I'm somebody who doesn't feel that, that uh, President Trump has been... Uh, uh, particularly good for Israel, that we'll he hasn't, that. hasn't done we'll the things we'll that he that. should have been doing. Nonetheless, this might have been a modest step, but it was a, a good step and it was an important step. Okay. I want the four of you to hear my take on it, and I'm very anxious to hear what you would say. I thought it was fabulous, and I don't see it the way you see it. I see it much more like Ellie sees it. I believe it is on the level of the Balfour Declaration and the partition of the, the formal vote on, in the United Nations on November 29, 1947, for the following reason. As long as major Western nations, specifically the United States, but not just the United States, refused to put its embassies in Jerusalem, it was giving tacit approval. It was tacitly endorsing 
the Palestinian narrative that Israel itself is not legitimate. That this was the last seal of approval from the United States and therefore from the West that said, you know, Israel has an, integ an intrinsic integrity of its own and that like every other nation state of the United Nations, it gets to choose where its capital is. And no threat, as this thing said, no threat of violence, no threat of they're going to be angry at American and other installations and buildings and embassies around the world. There's no, we're not held hostage to a, uh, that kind of blackmail. And that what we're saying is, all we do, as Eric said, we are, you said it too, we're acknowledging a fact on the ground. Jerusalem is the capital. But more than that, Israel has the right, the intrinsic sovereign right, to tell us where the capital is, and we have no right. We don't, in no other nation in the world do we tell the nation, no, we're not putting our embassy in the capital city that you designate. The one place on earth we've done that is Israel. And by doing that, we were sending a message to the Palestinians and to the world that, you know what, the integrity of Israel, the sovereignty of Israel, isn't really determined yet. It's not quite a sovereign state. And so, just as you pointed out, when the compromise plan was undercut, nothing changed on the ground, except that people felt differently. American Jews, you pointed out, felt the chasm had, had, had increased. The chasm has not. <coughs> nothing changed in terms mm -hmm. of the Israeli relationship to Israel. But we perceived it. There are Jews who perceived it as such. You are also mm -hmm. correct. Nothing's changed here. Oh, a building may be built. What Trump said was, we're going to start building an embassy. It's going to be a monument to peace. It's going to be the most gorgeous embassy. It was Trumpian talk. But there was also something sort of politically sophisticated about it. It wasn't about the embassy. It was about legitimizing not Jerusalem, but the state of Israel. And I do believe the Palestinian community heard it, understands it, and understands, and you spoke about it a moment ago. Barack Obama said there should be, this is his words, daylight between Israel and the United States. He said this mm -hmm. to Malcolm Online and, the, and the, all the people who were uh, assembled. I was at that table. You were at that table. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, was, it was a group of Jewish leaders not only representing the Conference of Presidents, correct? No, it was, it was a Conference of Presidents Okay, meeting. okay. That's what he said. And what Trump has done is said, no, there is no daylight. And this question about whether America could be an honest broker, Dershowitz comes on JBS and says, you know, America stopped being a broker, an honest broker when Barack Obama says, okay, the 2334. Because what he's saying is Israel is illegitimate. What Trump did was if America can be a broker at all, it's if the Palestinians believe that they can't continue to say to Israel, no peace. And the United States is now saying to Israel, it's time to, it's time to recognize Israel's legitimacy. And then, as Eric says, Trump says specifically, Ellie, we're saying nothing about the borders of East Jerusalem. That will be determined in bilateral, direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. I have said on JBS, if people read what uh, Donald Trump said, it was written for him. If they mm -hmm. read that speech and hear it in Barack Obama's voice, it was stunning. It was perfect. He said everything. And he said it with a certain kind of subtlety and sophistication that wasn't about moving the embassy. That'll come. The most important thing was to say to the world, you know, it's time to stop playing games. Israel has the right to determine its capital, and it is Jerusalem and the United States of America, which should have done this 70 years ago, is doing it today. I agree with you, uh, Mark. Of course, uh, practically speaking, except for moving the embassy, really made no change. We always knew that Jerusalem was the capital of, of Israel. Israel knew it. We accepted it. But the very fact 
uh, that 11 American presidents since the establishment of the State of Israel did not do so, or at least eight presidents since, uh, since Jerusalem became united, or even three presidents since the Jerusalem Embassy Act, that none of them said it, despite that from Reagan on almost, every single president said, I support a united Jerusalem. They all said they were going to do and it yet they were going to do it elected. And they never did. And yet Tr President Trump did it. That in itself demonstrated the importance, and it's correct. May not be the facts on the ground, except moving of, of embassies, but it's the perception. Okay, but and it's also basically removing the blind faults, as Stain said, of, of the Palestinians and the Arabs. And the idea that he did not say about East Jerusalem, that's fine. I think his speech was perfect, except I would have added one, one more sentence. And that sentence would be, I invite all the, the countries of goodwill to join me in that move. And he did not say that. But I, I am sure that many countries will be joined. Czechoslovakia already said they will do that. Many countries. When there's uh, a peace agreement. Yeah. Well, don't, don't distort no, but, them. But I'm sure eventually they walked many it back. They walked it back. First, their first statement was exactly what you said. Yes. The second statement was when there's okay, a peace they agreement. They probably got some pressure. But I am sure <laughs> that President Trump discussed that with heads of Arab countries before he made that, uh, that uh, announcement. And they probably told him, do whatever you want. Of course, officially, they have to say we are upset. But truthfully, as I know the Arabs, they couldn't care less about the Palestinians. And also, I'm I sure he spoke with the Abbas. Jordanians, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying yes. may be true. I doubt yes. if it's true of the, of the Jordanians, specifically. Uh, well, uh, the, the Jordanians, size of again, population. because of the right. size of Palestinian right. population. But deep down, he also, they were ready. They gave up on Judea and Samaria, the Jordanians, at all. It was only Rabin's insistence that, that Jordan should control the Temple Mount. But originally, they had given that up. And I'm sure he spoke with Abbas and told him, just don't make too much trouble. Don't be a troublemaker. One few days of rage, do it calmly. I am pretty sure that those conversations took place you want to say behind something? scenes. Sure. I wanted to add to what Ellie said. You know, the 11 prior presidents, I also think part of the problem there is mm -hmm. I'm not so sure the move in the embassy used to be that important to the Israelis. I think the Obama administration made it more important. I think had it not been, and I think this is something that Steve and I are in complete agreement, it's, it's, not, it's the way Obama handled himself. It was the, the impression that he created, the mood that he created, the Cairo speech that was not followed by the Jerusalem speech, the ongoing focus on settlements, not on Palestinian violence, disproportionate viol uh, uh, attacks from Israel, not about the bombs that are being uh, rockets hidden in Gaza installations. It was what he focused on. And I think <coughs> that for eight years of that, it became, and I think, of course, Trump came with a, you know, with, with a tsunami of, of, the, of the new possibilities of, I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. And this time, when I make a promise, I'll, f I'll fulfill this promise. Because it's true. Politically, we always heard in the past, yes, of course, we're going to move the embassy. I thought this was important. But remember, here's a guy that did not say, he did not for shut down, foreclose the possibility of East Jerusalem being the capital. He of the also spoke about a two-state solution. He also spoke about a two-state solution. So in a way, it really isn't, he didn't say that much. I think it was purely symbolic, but I do think it's in the aftermath of Resolution 2334. <coughs> 2334 <coughs> was such a gigantic game changer. It was so, uh, it's still, I must tell you, I think about it every day. It's so outrageous. I think about it every day. I'm so embarrassed as a Democrat that we had a democratic administration that actually didn't veto something. And by the way, that there was a, this is mind blowing as a law professor, that the President of the United States is a former law professor and that we allowed a document not to be vetoed that was legally completely inaccurate, contradicted everything we believed in, contradicted our foreign policy, contradicted Oslo, right? All of this I mean, contradicted even issues about other UN resolutions. So. I also think that, again, this idea, and I'm, I'm not sure everyone here would agree with me, I think it became more important to Israelis. It falls into the category of the denial of Israel's existence. And I've always actually thought, this is so outrageous. <laughs> this is one country in the world where we actually deny existence. That's very interesting. There's another area that we, 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 oh, we pass over this. Yes. You know, we I, treat this more casually. Of course people deny existence. Yeah. Imagine if we denied Canada's existence yeah. or Mexico's existence. Only one country that we can actually say. So when you say, yes, a country should have the sovereignty to decide when it's capital is, yeah, and you know what? It, the fact that Israel is a member state of the United Nations, it says in the uh, charter of the United, every country in this 
uh, body is entitled <coughs> to the respect and dignity mm. of a member state, except for one. One, we actually don't even deny their, we deny their existence altogether. So I'm saying some of these things, you know, Israel is always a special case. There are exceptions when it comes to Israel. Here we deny its existence. Here we don't even care where it's, we, we tell it where we want the embassy to be. You made a very interesting point. We had a chance to speak to Israeli journalists after this decision. And the, and the comment was made, Israelis didn't care yeah. whether Trump did this until he did it. Yeah. That they felt, we know where our capital yeah. is and we don't need, but once he did it, it meant the world to them. Very interesting. I'm getting emails from people bright, intelligent, well-meaning, committed people, Jews, very passionately liberal, who say to me, why did he have to do it now? All he's going to do is inflame things. And that one of the arguments was, <coughs> after all the years we haven't done it, this is just Trump being Trump, and that all he did was stir the pot which was unnecessary, and now the fallout is going to be horrific, and America can't be part, there'll be no peace process, America can't be part of the peace process, and all we're going to do is create violence aimed at Israelis and at Americans. This is unfair to you, but since I know how you feel about Trump, I expected you to say that. Since you didn't, I'm asking you now to respond if you'd received the emails I'd received saying, in essence, what I just described? Look, um, it seems to me that a number of things potentially are going on here. First of all, we're hearing from people who uh, simply despise Trump yes. and um, oppose anything that he does and assume that it will be a disaster. And, uh, well, I have a measure of sympathy <laughs> with that approach. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's, it's particularly helpful. Second of all, I think we're dealing with people who simply don't have a good understanding of what Israel is about um, and uh, what Jerusalem is about. I think we're probably dealing with people who viscerally don't have ties to Jerusalem that everybody uh, in, in this room has, and also who don't understand, and probably did not read the speech, by the way. Right. It's very important yeah. to read the speech. And I, I, I agree, by the way. I thought it was a, a wonderful speech. It was, was exceedingly well done. Uh, and the heart of the matter was a point that, that many of us have said here. He, he is confirming formally on behalf of his government what has been a historical reality for 70 years. And he was saying, let's not deny that reality. So there is no argument against that. Uh, as, as uh, far as I'm concerned. And the final point uh, uh, that I would make is, look, a, n a number of people, myself included, have said that um, in addition to this, I'm somebody who affirms this, said this was right, this is important, Trump, in fact, needs a broader plan. What's the strategy? You know, I'd, I'd like to know that there's a broader strategy here so that we have a sense of where this might go and whether it's going to be good for Israel or not. I mean, I think that's a reasonable question for people on both the right and the left to be asking. And I sense that that also is, is uh, part of what we're hearing here. So uh, that's what I suggest is going on. Lastly, Thomas Friedman wrote a piece in the New York Times about Trump giveaway. That Trump did this without extracting anything from Israel to do it. I was offended by that characterization. It's, to me, it would be like somebody saying, um, you want me to respect you as a person? Give me something for exactly. it. All he was saying to Israel, all he was saying was, we will respect Israel's integrity. And I don't feel Israel had to give anything for it. But that's me. Does any, do any of you have a different perspective on the Thomas Friedman formula? Well, Thomas Friedman is not known to be a lover of Israel, no matter what he says. He has been an anti-Zionist, an anti-Israel. Most of his predictions have been incorrect in the last 20 years. And the worst uh, offense is that he thinks he is a prophet of what's going to happen in the future. And like I said, 90% of his so-called prophecies have failed to be the truth. Now, I want 
to hear from him whenever we make concessions to the Arabs and the Palestinians. Did he ever say, what did we get in exchange? What did we extract from them? He never said that. It was always we have to extract from Israel. Always Israel has to make a step for confidence for this. And the Arabs and Palestinians, they could always, like a little baby crying, you got to give them a, the, 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 what do you call pacify. that? Uh, the pacify, thank you. And that's all what Thomas Friedman knows how to say. So I have no respect yeah, I, for him I, whatsoever. I, I, I radically disagree that that's all Tom Friedman has to say. Uh, first of all, he was the columnist who exposed the uh, rejection of Israel after peace treaties had been signed uh, in, the, in the 1990s, Oslo and, and the, treaty, the treaty with Egypt. He's the one who said, we're the Muslim intellectuals today. They're rejecting Israel. He was the one who did it, and that obviously gave that position a great deal of credibility. His book, From Beirut to Jerusalem, I had one major problem with it that seemed to suggest the kind of moral equivalence between Beirut and Jerusalem. But it has a fantastic chapter in there on why does Israel get so much press coverage that's so negative? Because it's the only open society in the Middle East. So before we uh, d demonize Tom Friedman, let's realize, that, like most of us, he has virtues and vices. Do you agree More with his analysis than virtues. in this case? Look, the specifics of his analysis was that um, Trump should have demanded a, uh, a settlement freeze, as I recall. In yes. other words, that's what, that was the quid pro quo, if you will. Now, the basic point here is that all Trump was doing, and that really, I think some of you have sort of magnified it out of all significance, all he was doing was correcting an anomaly within American foreign policy. In other words, he was saying, we all know where the capital of Israel is. Let's do so officially. So in that you respect- You make it sound so simple. Explain to me then why no president, it was a conscious decision not to move, not to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. Why do you think it was? Administration, air freedom administration, For 44 did times. not want to do okay, this. Okay, so after 1948, American foreign policy basically said Jerusalem is to be internationalized. The good news there was that no one did anything about it. In other words, that um, essentially America treated it with benign neglect. I'm sorry, say it again. When was this said? 1947, the partition. This is, yeah. Yes, this is before the War of Independence. And even after the War of the Vatican still wanted internationalization. Yeah. Yes, but. But everything but, was off the yes, table. Yes, who would agree? Yeah, right. the whole, point, everything changes the when the Palestinians and the, the Arabs away. don't want to accept partition and go to war. Yes. The, the Green Line is, had nothing to do with the partition plan. Understood, but the, the fact that America supported internationalization in 1947, effectively determined America, where the placement of the embassy would be post December 13th, 49, which is when Ben-Gurion yes. declared okay. the capital to but be Jerusalem. But you, you make it sound like there's no big deal here. If it was no big deal, why wasn't it done till now? Uh, Reagan did try to do it. Uh, he offered as a package deal. In other words, he did what Tom Friedman wanted him to do. He said, free settlements and we'll move the embassy to Jerusalem. So that was, the, that was the dominant thinking. But you're now, not telling me why they didn't. Why did president after president not do I think something? Init initially, for the first 20 years, it was because of uh, the internationalization principle. Fine. Okay, how and about last 15? And after that, what, what's been said before, they thought they had to uh, coddle the Arab states. And if they, didn't, if, they, if, they, if they did it, they'd be destroying any hope for peace. And essentially, it was treating them as babies, in effect, by saying, you know, since we know you're so unreasonable, therefore we won't do the reasonable thing in order to keep you smiling at us. That's, I think all, that's, that's all what it is. Look, and there was a freeze of settlements. Uh, Netanyahu froze settlements. The moratorium for, for well, 10 months. Yeah, but why do you but say it like something. it doesn't count? I didn't say it didn't count. I just okay. said call it what yeah. it is. And at no uh, point during that 10-month period yeah. did, did, uh, did uh, Abbas ever agree to have any discussions. And yeah. at the end of the 10 months, he asked for another moratorium. Yeah. Look, my response <laughs> to Friedman is he's sort of raising the question of, we have a broader diplomatic picture. We want to find a way to move forward. You can give something to one side. What, what about the other side? Um, so for, for somebody who's a diplomatic correspondent, I don't think that's a terrible way to think. My response to that is, he did give something to the other side. In other words, what Israel got was recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And no matter what happens, the President of the United States is now saying, <laughs> that that is going to be the reality, that's the reality as of now. What did the Palestinians get? What they got was a statement from the President of the United States that it's not simply a united city. Uh, we're, we're not talking about sole sovereignty, the sole sovereignty document. He is not accepting that. Those matters are going to be determined 
by negotiations. You're absolutely right. You're and so absolutely he right. put aside the, the, the far right position in Israel. This notion, this whole notion, I mean, in my article, which is going to be out today, I believe, uh, you know, this whole notion is a, a, a giveaway to the far right. It was nothing of, nothing of the sort. Right. It was a sensible, moderate, reasonable position, very important to the Jews, very important on Jerusalem, but that leaves open a whole range of diplomatic uh, possibilities. For a president, again, in my view, who hasn't been particularly supportive of the things that are important to Israel, this is the one thing for which he deserves tremendous credit, so we have to give him credit. Okay, so let's come to this. Um, what you said was the most important Jewish event of 2017 was the inauguration, Donald Trump taking office as President of the United States. Amplify for us. Well, there are impacts both domestically and internationally, since we're talking Israel, we'll begin internationally. Donald Trump ran as an isolationist. Uh, make America great again was, as we all know, an isolationist slogan. That wasn't uh, a matter of chance. He chose... He, he oh, chose I don't understand it. I know how it came about. It came about out of a New York Times meeting. It was not a philosophical decision by Trump. Trump never meant that as an isolationist. What he meant was priority. And I don't understand why anybody doesn't argue that the head of state of every country doesn't, it's as obvious as saying Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's obvious, every, every nation puts its interests first, and Trump has never said there's no other interest. Trump has not, not only that, if, oh, oh, Trump was a reaction to Obama. Obama was the isolationist oh, please. in his presidency. Look, he is the one who withdrew action. from the world. He is the one who withdrew the leadership of the U.S. from the world. So but Trump was no, a reaction to Obama, and he certainly is not an isolationist. I have no idea <laughs> what it's a question doing. of priority. I agree with Mark. I have no idea what you're talking about. Donald Trump made it clear that he was going to focus on America and that he was going to put aside matters related to the rest of the world. Um, he did not see America as uh, the, the leader of the world. There was a great deal of bluster. We're going to go after ISIS. We're going to build up our military. Not things that I'm supportive of, by the way. But in terms of being the, the, the leader of uh, the free world, uh, engaged in building alliances and sort of enforcing the rules by which liberal democracies operate around the world, he was going to back away from that, and in fact he has. Now let's, let's look at what he's done. Uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, an absolutely uh, critical trade pact that would have given us, uh, first of all, built up alliances and given us leverage against China, which is uh, uh, something very essential to us, he pulled out of it. He pulled out of the, uh, the Paris uh, climate, uh, change. climate Accords. Uh, he raised all kinds of issues in his dealings with NATO, scaring to death all of our NATO partners, um, questioned at first whether or not um, um, Article 5 of the NATO treaty was going to be enforced by the United States, which is the common defense uh, uh, part and the most important part, which makes the treaty real. He ultimately sort of came around, but every single one of the NATO partners is now scrambling uh, to be concerned about how it might defend itself because they no longer feel they can depend on the, on the United States. He has pulled back from his commitments. And let's see how he has, uh, you know, also has this obsession with Russia, put it aside, I'm not talking about the investigations now, um, whereby he finds something attractive about uh, autocrats and dictators around the world. And let's see how this plays out for Israel. I mean, first of all, Israel needs a great power as a patron. For Israel to survive throughout their entire history, and since 1967, it's been the United States of America. So how is, is Israel impacted here? Let's take a look at Syria. Who's the dominant? Uh, I mean, we talked about Obama in Syria forever. I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in the president of the United States. But that's when it started. I'm, I'm it is the withdrawal I'm of in Obama the from the Syria States. that allowed Russia and Iran to I'm interested in what's enter. happening now. So. Uh, right now, the dominant power in Syria is Russia. Um, That's thanks to Obama, I have to say. It did precede. We, 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 we cannot I'm see, not, we not cannot see reality in, okay, but in it a vacuum. It sound as if you're blaming can, Trump. Yes, there. you cannot I see the reality asked, in vacuum. That, that reality came from eight years of, of isolationism. States for one year has been Donald Trump. And, for example, when they were negotiating a deal, 
between Jordan, uh, the Russians, and the Americans on uh, you know, this question of how close Iranian troops were to be permitted to come to Israel's border. So first of all, that was negotiated without the participation of Israel, without the participation of Israel. And the issue, was it going to be 20 miles or 40 miles, or was it 20 kilometers and 40 kilometers? I'm not 100% I'm not sure. The point is, either way, we're talking about a reality in Syria. Um, the Americans were a part of those negotiations. The Israelis were not, and we're talking about a Syrian president far closer to the, the northern border of Israel than uh, is uh, 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 safe uh, for the Israelis. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel was deeply upset and, and deeply concerned. For all the bluster about Iran, what is different with Iran right now? Is the Iran test, the Iran treaty been canceled on the first day? You didn't want it canceled. Has the Iran Treaty been canceled you on didn't the first? Want it canceled. I, it's yeah. true. I did not want it canceled. Uh, has he taken a tough line? But how on, is that against? On, how is that? Anti, how does that hurt Israel? I. But wait. My, part of my problem here is I didn't bring pro and pro and anti-Trump people to this forum, and I, first of all, I'm not going to defend, defend the president. I don't know if anybody here wants to defend the president when you. When you your first thing you said was, I believe Trump is bad for Israel and the Jews. Correct. Okay, and I wanted to hear as specifically as you could, not about how you feel about the Trump administration overall, because then I would need there are people I could have had here to answer, and I don't want to answer. It's not I don't feel like I have any desire to answer. I'm not taking any position here against or for Trump. The only thing I've, I've taken a position on consistently on JBS is people shouldn't be demagog demagogic in either direction, for or against Trump. There are issues to be discussed. I don't want to hear that he's a bad man, and he's a racist, and he's a buff. No, you didn't. didn't say no, no, that. you did not. But what I do want to hear is... Eric Yaffe would be happy that many of the things Trump said as a candidate, and it's not just Trump who's guilty of that pattern. Many candidates promise all kinds of things. They get in office. It's a different world. Trump, Trump too. For some reason, Trump said it as a candidate. He's held. Why aren't you doing it? I'm happy that he didn't. That the, you should be happy that the Iran deal he left alone. Many things he said... Turns out he became president. He moved to the center. Everybody moves to the center. Tell me where a policy of Donald Trump hurts either Israel or American Jewry. Well, first of all, there's no question that his policy on Syria has been wrong, that he's allowed the, Sur the uh, Iranians to develop a presence there, that it's close to, too close to the border, that he has not asserted himself against the Russians and uh, uh, demanded that there should be no Iranian okay. presence in, in, well in said. the country altogether. Well said. Give me something that, else. That's, that's, uh, You've a, done a, that a, eloquently. Give me an other example. Well, as I was suggesting before, America needs to be the leader of the free world and uh, a superpower and a patron upon whom Israel can depend. How is that? Oh, and, and, uh, and you just weaker, spoke movingly about this decision uh, on Jerusalem, which does exactly what you're asking America to do. Uh, a weaker America is a danger for Israel. America that withdraws from international responsibilities is a danger for Israel. Uh, I want an, a, a, an assertive America that builds alliances with democratic countries okay. around the world, right. and I don't believe he's done that. Based on that analysis, you're saying more than any other event in the Jewish year, Trump's inauguration is more significant. Just want everybody to understand, based on what you have just said. Well, I haven't talked about the domestic side. I, I want to pick up on a couple of these things. Um, I, I agree fully there's a need for f fairness. And frankly, at times, I feel the uh, political discussion is not terribly fair. In other words, uh, yeah, Eric said it earlier. There are, there are people out there that wouldn't give him credit for anything he does. Um, that said, what I would underscore is that uh, there is a pronounced difference in the tone of U.S.-Israel relations. And I applaud that. That's exactly what I would like. What I'd like to see. Um, I often had the sense during the eight years of Obama that uh, the tone had shifted so negatively 
that Israel cannot count on Obama being true to his word of Israel, America will have Israel's back. Um, I feel a lot better about that now. And so you disagree with Eric in that regard? I think in that respect, in terms of the tone, there's been a definite improvement. What's happened at the same time, though, and this is, I guess, what, what causes me uh, concern, is that as, uh, on the foreign front, we'll talk about domestically as well, but uh, on the foreign front, the real danger in terms of U.S.-Israel relations is that it's becoming a partisan issue rather than bipartisan. Now, again, that did not begin with Trump. You know, in other words, the, the tendency had been earlier. Democrats are cool to Israel. Republicans are uh, in, in love with Israel. But sharpening that tendency is, in the long run, bad for Israel, if for no other reason, because uh, Republicans will not be presidents forever. And the bipartisan consensus behind U.S.-Israel policy, which really had gone back at least to uh, Lyndon Johnson, if not further back to Harry Truman, that bipartisan consensus has fallen apart directly, along, uh, directly on our watch, so to speak. Yes. Trump has fed into that. Okay. Now, oh, one I, of the I'm sensitive to this. Right. And I agree with you. We've talked about this before on JBS, the importance of bipartisanship. Right. Show me how Trump has exacerbated that issue. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen Trump say or do anything that suggests he is in some way encouraging Republican as opposed to American support. Uh, what, I, what I said is that the, the trend, which was there pre-Trump, continues under him and in some respects is getting worse. I don't think it has anything to do with Trump. Well, it's a trend that's happening on his watch, <coughs> if you will. That's, okay, uh, all right. Um, if you turn to the domestic side, there is, there is one major issue, and that is uh, it's embodied by Charlottesville. Uh, in other words, you had a clear-cut expression of, uh, you know, we will not let the Jews take over. Um, uh, Richard Spencer, all that. Is that a reflection of the kind of climate that the way Trump ran his campaign and his tendency towards polarization since he's become president. Are you sure it is? How can anyone, look, first of all, he's not doing it himself. He didn't go to Charlottesville and lead the charge. The issue is that the climate that he helped create during the campaign was a climate that gave voice to more extremist elements within American society. The worst moment for me, um, had nothing to do with Israel or Jews, but I think it's, it spoke volumes, was uh, mocking a handicapped reporter on television. Um, what kind of human being does, does that sort of thing? In other words, here's a person who, no fault of his own, has a handicap, and you expect the President of the United States will at least treat him with respect, but so he mocked him. So he shouldn't have been elected. Well. Okay, but he was elected. He was elected, okay, absolutely. And now the question is, the question what, is, is what, cli what climate okay. has he helped create? Okay, who created the climate of Skokie? You and I lived through a period. Right, yeah. When... Nazis said they were going to march, and they not only were going to march in Skokie, they picked a specifically Holocaust, Holocaust survivors. survivor community right. to march through Skokie. I'm not good at this. Who was president? Jimmy Carter. Did Carter do that? No, I don't think he did. Okay. Retrospectively, okay. we could blame him for that. Okay. By the way, <laughs> I remember what happened. I remember Jews were very upset. I remember Jews also are very committed to the free speech, and that ultimately the ACLU, Dershowitz, every liberal I knew, including me, said it's heinous, but they have the right to do it. They got a permit. Okay. Then they went and they marched. They actually, never, pick, did. They actually never marched. They, 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 canceled, they canceled the march. Yeah, but but my, the issue came in a day and went in a day. And nobody went out with clubs to confront them. No one went down there looking for a fight. My own sense is you have in America, you always have, you probably always will, a fringe, nutty, disgusting element which also has anti-Semitism inbred in them. This isn't new. This developed, by the way, out of this whole idea now if anybody once ever had a slave and they were part of the Confederacy, we're going to tear down their statues. That's another issue. Yes. And ultimately, the people, the initial reason for the march was to march against this. Now, I know viewers are going to hear me and they're going to say, oh, you're, you are defending white supremacists in Charlottesville. I am not. All I'm saying is they should have come in a day, went in a day, and it wouldn't have been an issue. 
this is a, we live in a different climate where what it means to be a liberal activist is not to sit in a street, not to march across a bridge, it's to go looking for a fight. So are you defending? And, and that, and I am defending. Are you defending President Trump's remarks after the event? I, I, 100%. What Trump said was, I am critical of both sides. By the way, the ACLU comes out with a report and it says, we can't tell you who threw the first punch. It's not clear to us it was the white supremacists. By the way, they are heinous. But it was a much more sophisticated issue, and Trump is lambasted. The next day he comes out and says, I repudiate, and he goes through the list of everything you and I repudiate. He said it as clear as day, and this is not a sophisticated politician or president. <clears throat> and it still wasn't good enough for people. Why well, wasn't good enough for people? You know, well, we wanted him to say, uh, we want you to repudiate white supremacists, the KKK, David Duke, everyone. He came out the next day. I repudiate, and he went through the list. But the fact that he had said, again, the painful truth, the truth was people who represented me went down looking for a fight. They didn't say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to block the sidewalk. We're going to block the street. We're going to force the police to come and take, cart us away. No, 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 no. We're going to get down there wearing helmets with picks and shovels and clubs. And that's in the same category with two examples. The Jews will not replace us. And you know, you know what was the worst thing about that for me, which sits with me? Certain things I know sit with you. We have a synagogue there, and it had a Shabbat service, and I wonder, well, you know, would they have the Shabbat service? So ultimately, of course, they, they did, which was the right thing. And so some Nazis came out in front to intimidate them. So there's this group of Nazis standing in front of the synagogue. So the people inside didn't know what to do. They'd asked for police protection, didn't get it. So ultimately, they decided they were, they, they you know, snuck out the back door. I went crazy. <coughs> I went crazy. Crazy. My response to, to my wife and to others was, "This is America. Right. Jews do not walk out the back door. Right. Right. We walk out the front door. I will not live in an America where we're, we have to walk out the back door." Good for you, Eric. And my my point is, there may be lots of people who are to blame. I need the top officials of my government, including the president and others as well, when that happens, to speak up. He did. Well, maybe so. I, I wasn't well, satisfied. Let me say one thing. I, I'm not here to defend President Trump either. I'm just here what I feel to defend truth and reality. Uh, and, and, uh, and that is uh, that, and I'm going to make a, a, a statement that might not uh, uh, resonate with many people. Anybody who can tell you today that President Trump is not good for Israel, they're either blind or deaf. Because, especially if we have the government of Israel, an overwhelming majority of Israelis agreeing that President Trump is very good for the state of Israel, how can we here sit and say, no, he's not good for Israel, except and unless we disagree with his policies that are supporting the present government of Israel. And that's why we don't think what he's doing for Israel. We are going, like J Street, for example, right, who's going to dictate, right, what's good for Israel, and therefore, any president that does not support uh, what J Street supports, then is not good for Israel, because they have a different view for Israel. I do feel, as Stephen said, yes, I'm feeling much more comfortable that the U.S. government has the back of Israel. It has been made a joke already that in Obama time, he, which he said it many times, that he has the back of Israel. Unfortunately, was to stab it many times, not just once. And so when we think of, of Trump, as his election for the Jewish people, I think it was extremely positive. And to blame Trump for the first year for what's happening in Syria is like blaming a second husband of a pregnant woman by the first husband that he got her pregnant. He has to deal with the situation. But the problem really started from Obama, that he abandoned Syria, abandoned that whole fight, and allowed the Iranian and the Russian because of the vacuum that he created. Even Egypt was going 
to, towards the Russian sphere because yeah. they felt abandoned by Obama after the election of Morsi because Morsi, oh, it was not a democratic election. It was a coup d'etat against a democratically elected Muslim Brotherhood government. So what has Trump done in the last year so, to help so remedy that? I, has, I think he definitely increased, uh, not just I think, he definitely increased the, the weaponry in that area to fight ISIS. They have, they have gone a great length now to fight ISIS and to, and to win that fight. And I'm not exactly sure if Israel uh, is so unhappy that Assad is still in power because he still brings stability to that region. Because without him, you're going to have 12 different region, tribes, countries, each one fighting each other and fighting Israel at the same time. So Israel has made, has drawn the, the line on the sand, so to speak, and I think Russia knows it, Iran knows it, and the United States know, know, know it. But again, it's just a question of what reality is and what truth. Yes. By the way, while I was very disappointed with some of the things that President Obama did and said, and 2334 is just, was over, was just, insane. It was very clear that Obama was given enormous credit for intelligence cooperation between the United States and Israel and for military support of Israel from the United States, including the Iron Dome, and that it's not as if everything Obama did was to hurt Israel. And what Steve said, and I thought it was very sophisticated, it had to do more with the tone, and it was a way of talking about Israel that was hurtful, but no one should, I don't think anyone should suggest that Obama was the worst president for Israel we've ever had, and in many ways, Israel said over and over again, this guy's fabulous, and I'm just sorry that some, that it's interesting, his rhetoric and his style and whatever was driving him ideologically didn't always square with what he actually did vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But, but that made a difference, and that probably is the beginning of the, of the fall of the bipartisan support of Israel. Had Obama's pronouncements been much more moderate vis-a-vis -vis Israel, this breakup of bipartisanship for Israel would not have taken place. And I think he definitely fed that. And uh, the longer he was staying, the longer it was going to cause that that split, and especially with the Iran uh, uh, nuclear agreement. So, so for, you, you want to give him credit? I, I give him a lot of credit that he did support Israel strategically, although many say that this was the, Pentagon, the Pentagon's approach, <laughs> not the president's approach. But be that as it may, no question. But yes, the tone, the, the language that he, that he spoke, all of that, I think, helped create that schism or that breakup of bipartisan support of Israel. Before Obama, no Democrat would dare to be anti-Israel, so to speak. After Obama, it's a legitimate position for a Democrat to be anti-Israel. Any comment? Well, I'm just going to recall a year ago uh, here on this set and even before that, uh, when you asked how many people thought the, move, the embassy move would take place, no one did. Just for perspective, it still hasn't happened. <laughs> but, but, but the reality if is, I'm not mistaken, had I been last, here, I would have said yes. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, last year when I, we asked the same question, what was the most important Jewish event, you said the election of Donald Trump. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was interesting to me that this year, Eric says the inauguration of Donald Trump uh, was most Anybody else want to say anything else about Trump yeah, and, wanna, and Jews or Israel? I want to add something that speaks to something that I know you vehemently disagree with, but I said on this show a year ago and even before, well, during the campaign period, throughout history, Jews have never done well with mobs. I've said it several times on this show. I've said it on radio and TV around the country. And that, you know, I just reviewed a book for the Washington Post, Simon Shama's new book on uh, the story, of the the Jews. story of the Jews. This is part two, which takes you from uh, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain to Zionism. Uh, so it's 500 years. And uh, there are many things that are interesting in the book, but the one thing is this ongoing reminder how hellish it was, wherever they were around the world, the diaspora, with the exception of the Ming Dynasty, which I now learned from that book, one area, one place of the total sense of Jewish uh, emancipation was the Ming Dynasty, and Amsterdam, actually, of the 17th century. Um, but everywhere they went, expulsions, wearing hats, uh, badges, uh, inquisitions, 
uh, and mops, blood libels, the amount of blood. This is, you know, we used to think of it as, yes, only in Russia and the past. No, everywhere. Blood, blood libels everywhere. So what I would say is, and this is not a full indictment of Trump, that he has normalized, and we've discussed this, you disagree, but he has normalized an attitude that, and it's one of the reasons why initially during the campaign he would, did not repudiate David Duke is because he understands that he does have a core group of supporters, not all of them, but he has some, who have a kind of white supremacist, you know, anti-Semitic anti sensibility. I'm not saying that this is his orientation. I'm saying that I, it seems to me that Charlottesville and other events during his administration have normalized it in a way that it had been even during Skokie, much more buried underground. Nationalism, like nativism, racism, have returned to the national consciousness in a way that they hadn't before. Uh, Right-wingers and anti-Semites in particular have been emboldened. Uh, Anti-Semitism is up, according to most ADL statistics. I know this from my own All, all of this has happened under Trump's watch. Uh, I don't think he's directly encouraged it. I do think he's kind of winked a few times and chosen to remain silent when he should be in the forefront of battling this. I think so Americans... But I, but I don't think anyone can uh, you know, disagree with him. Obviously, people are free to disagree. But uh, when we met uh, a year ago and sort of viewed it in, in the, uh, the events of 2016, I don't think anyone would have said that uh, right-wing extremism, anti-Semitism, these are significant threats to the Jewish world. We're concerned about the left in terms of delegitimization of Israel. But we thought that the... Uh, the, the relegation of the right wing to the margins of American society had been long, develop, long developments and that we didn't have to spend all that much time worrying about them. What's happened over the last year is that, that those taboos have been lifted. Uh, I don't lay it completely at the feet of the president, but again, over the course of the past year, these voices have come out into the open, whereas they've been pretty much marginalized, if not repressed entirely, uh, until January 20th. As you said, Mark, I think President Trump is being blamed more than they would have blamed any other previous president. Uh, and that's because who he is. Uh, the reality is that uh, anti-Semitic acts by right-wing supremacists in the past year is much, much higher than, than in this year. Last year, you mentioned about the JCC swastikas and all those attacks and all the left-wing liberal wing of, Ju of Judaism rose uh, clamoring, it's uh, Trump's fault, it's Trump's fault because of the environment that he created, because he abetted and so on and so forth, to find out that it was a deranged Jew Israeli who did that. Uh, but, and, but truthfully, the amount of anti-Semitism or the anti-Semitic danger from right-wing supremacists pales in comparison to the anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism that is coming from the left-wing BDS movement and their sympathizers. They are the, great, the real danger to Jews and to Israel, not the right-wing supremacists who are really, they have been relegated to history. Every once in a while they rear their head. But how many, how many of them are, are brainwashing our own children in universities against Israel? How many of them are calling on boycotting Israel? And they're succeeding. How many of them are writing pieces in, in newspapers to try to delegitimize Israel? How many? Ellie, I suggest so you if you compare that to the left-wing anti-Semitism, they pale in comparison. And, and, and President Trump is not the fire that is fueling I that. suggest you read ADL data. I suggest you, you go to their website and, and you read also recent statements by Jonathan uh, Greenblatt, who kind of runs through uh, the increases on anti of anti-Semitism of various sorts from various camps. Yes. And I want to suggest to you what you're going to find there is contrary to what you've just said. And uh, he talks more, much more along the lines of what Steve yeah, is suggesting. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say of, that, of, uh, uh, that, I, that, uh, that his view might be skewed also. All right, well, look. That's uh, only um, I can say. I'm, I, I, so I'm I, relying I won't, on I won't, their, ta I won't take it. Uh, I'm I'm I will take it with a grain of salt. Let me put it that way. All right, if you choose to do so, fine. I'm relying on his data. Uh, whatever his views are, I found it to be uh, reliable. Okay, he's coming from somebody who worked for George Soros. I will be very, very hard pressed to accept his, uh, his analysis. I listen to you speak, and I am wholly, I'm totally open. I want to know what the truth is. It's not about an ideology for me. If it's true, I want to know about it. 
And to the extent to which JBS can report on it, in some instances even expose what's going on, I want to do that. I've seen nothing myself. And I mean seen nothing. First of all, we live in New York, East Coast. I don't know if it's here. I only know I've never, I've not seen it, I've not smelled it, I've not touched it, hasn't touched me, hasn't touched my children, hasn't touched my grandchildren, nothing. But that may be just the geographical area in which we live. So if it's happening elsewhere in America, it's certainly real. The fact that it doesn't happen in New York doesn't make it not real. But I haven't, I don't even, when I, I don't see it. I don't see it written about in a way that makes me scared for a moment. I'm a rabbi in Stanford, Connecticut. Somebody puts a, a, a swastika on the fence of one of my congregants. This is maybe, I don't know, 35 years ago. It was upsetting. It didn't represent anything in Stanford. It was never, no other congregant of mine has had any swastikas written on their sidewalk or on their fence. So I said to you, I, I believe there's always going to be, always. Anti-Semitism is so endemic, even where there are no Jews living, there's anti-Semitism there. But Steve, I don't see it. I don't see what you're describing. I don't see what Eric says Jonathan Greenblatt's describing. I do know, by the way, it's easy to say, anti-Semitic events are up 300%. Yeah, and we started at 12. So the percentage is not important to me. I want, to know, I want to know what, what the anti-Semitic <coughs> incidents are. I want to know who's been hurt, what property's been destroyed, what people have been intimidated. The Nazi example, by the way, outside the synagogue, that's real. But I don't know that that's a phenomenon it that was, really should, should worry me and should worry the JBS audience at this point in time. You're not disturbed about Jewish journalists getting, uh, getting hate mail? Two million. No. The 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 ADL came, uh, you know, uh, did some very thorough research, and two million social media messages, uh, uh, you know, right wing anti Semitic attacks uh, during and after the the Trump campaign. Um, this was very widely reported on. Bethany Mendel uh, went out and bought a gun. <laughs> because she was attacking Trump from the right, and uh, she was so frightened uh, by what was happening. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Again, I'll say this again. I am happy to learn that there's more of a threat here in America. <laughs> why, than you I believe why are you happy? You're, you're not happy. Why are you happy? No, to no. Learn? What I mean is, I would no. I'd be happy to learn whatever the learning is. I would be happy about it because I don't want to represent something that isn't true. However, to the best of my ability, as I watch across the spectrum, there is no significant increase in anything that makes me worry as an American Jew. You more worried as an American Jew today? I think, look, I've said this before on this program, no society in diaspora Jewish history has been as receptive to Jewish yes. participation. Yes, has it changed? We are still in the most secure position we've ever been in. However, what my real concern, to such as it is, is that the taboo on anti-Semitism that really goes back a good number of years, decades really, since the end of World War II, that taboo seems to be lifting. I don't see it. It, it is I lifting, but it. it's not lifting from the right wing as much from the left as, the, as from that, the left wing. But that's not what but, but, I mean, Steve means. He, uh, I know. about anti-Israel rhetoric But that on the is anti-Semitism also. I mean, it the may be, Jewish but that's not student, what he's talking about. I know about. that's not what he's talking and about, I'm but I'm trying to refocus if, the conversation. I'm if he's right, then I want to. I want more. Yeah. I want to know more about it. Understood. I agree. Okay. I agree. Um, so we can't end the session now without my hearing from all four of you. Who is the person of the year, Ellie? For you, who was the Jewish person of the year? I think Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Because like his politics or not like his politics, because he he is being he's able to really uh, lead a country that has now had the highest amount of diplomatic relations, uh, technology highest in the world almost, that uh, is able to really direct the policy of the Jewish people in a sense, 
being welcomed into Africa, into Asia, into South America, uh, with a uh, with the respect that Israel has has gotten, uh, and certainly uh, in a sense uh, being that person of the year that has influenced or that had mostly influenced the destiny of the Jewish people. Very interesting. By the way, the American Interest magazine in January, which every year publishes a list of the top eight powers of the world, for the first time included Israel among the top eight, ranking it eighth, by the way. But for Israel to be described as a rising power with a growing impact on world affairs, and we're talking about little teeny tiny Israel. That's quite something. So I understand why Netanyahu is your person of the year. We'll see if people agree or disagree. All right, Eric, who is your person of the year, Jewish person of the year for 2017? Uh, Israeli President uh, Ruvain Rivlin. Because? Um, he has provided a, a moral compass. Uh, at, a, at a time when we don't have heroes, who's been a hero? At a time when uh, Israel has been struggling in its public life uh, to have a, a clear moral direction and to deal with difficult issues, he's been somebody who has come forward. Uh, I always admire somebody who's prepared to take on his own camp, and he's a man of the right who has not been afraid to speak up against uh, the right. Uh, I'll mention, you know, two. Two examples of what I'm talking about, the Elor Azaria case, which had to do with a, an Israeli soldier who, who killed uh, a, uh, a prisoner who was, was restrained. On the ground. A, a, on the ground. It was just a terrorist. A, 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 he was a terrorist. Okay, I mean, there's I mean, no question. He was, he, he was a terrorist uh, who, who, was was, a, who was wounded and was, was restrained, yeah. and uh, he was, was killed by an Israeli uh, yeah. Soldier. And by the way, it was a very controversial case. Hugely controversial case, dealt with very well by the military, much less so by the politicians who rushed forward, who rushed forward to offer their support to this man who committed a, a, a crime which was initially murder and then was reduced to manslaughter. Oh, he was ultimately convicted. Uh, uh, he was really convicted. Court. He was convicted. And uh, the politicians uh, I, used this as an opportunity to curry favor with the public to proclaim him a hero. And when an effort was made to commute his sentence, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, among others, Defense Minister Lieberman, came forward and said his sentence must be commuted, it was Rivlin who said, no, that's not, that's, that's not what we're about. Uh, uh, Tohar Neshek, uh, uh, purity of arms, this, this concept that we are a moral army uh, and, and a, a moral people, that's what we're about. That, that took huge courage. And the, the other example, at a time when Israel was, the legislature was playing around with a number of non-democratic laws. We don't have to go into the details. Uh, in his yearly speech to the, the Knesset, uh, to the Knesset, Rivlin said once again, we're a democratic country. We abide by democratic norms. And he called upon parties of the right, and he's a man of the right, to back away and put these laws aside. Um, uh, Israel has a right to be proud of, of, of this man. Uh, with whom I disagree on virtually every political issue, but has shown great personal cover, uh, uh, great personal courage, and has has really been uh, a light of morality for Israel and for the world. That's lovely. I, I, I guess the yeah. moral compass of President Rivlin did not help him when he gave clemency to his corrupt buddy Ehud Olmert, corrupt and several times. So uh, versus a soldier who felt he was defending himself and protecting his platoon. So where is the moral compass of President Rivlin when, because it's his buddy. That reminds me of President Clinton giving clemency to Rich, Mark Rich. The Israeli army does not murder restrained people who are lying helpless uh, on uh, the ground, it, it was a terrorist. no matter what they have done. It was a terrorist done. who he feared. It was, he had a bomb and in he was a, going to kill the rest of the platoon. In a 250-page statement by the That's Israeli army produced by the court, they demolished that argument and said there was no truth to it. That's read how the, he felt. I don't know how we can. The, I, I don't know how they can. The, I don't know. Judgment. I read that judgment. I don't know how uh, 250 pages can describe the feeling of a person. If he said that, that was his feeling. Well, I'm not the sure. Argu the argument in his favor was not that he was a hero. It was that he was a frightened kid. Exactly. And that this frightened kid wasn't trained well, 
and got frightened yes. and was worried that the, although this terrorist was definitely restrained, that he was still a threat, and so he shot him. But, and, uh, but and, giving clemency and, to a corrupt uh, yeah, politician, I that's understand. his buddy, that's um, okay. Riv and, Rivlin's uh, comment is a comment really directed to Israeli society, that at the end of the day, we are a society based yes. upon law. Yes, and, it, it, well, it if is that's a, the case, then they should keep Olmert also by based against law. He was condemned. He was supposed to finish his years. So it's the same thing. The argument is the same. It's Omer question is giving clemency. Omer is somewhat comparable to Nixon. In other words, he did some terrible things, obviously. But uh, Ford pardoned Nixon on the grounds of it's the national interest that we pulled together on this. Right. By the same it's token, it was the national interest. interest. Omer to pardon Omer for national interest? He, well, so he, could, run, he could run. Omer uh, was guilty uh, of financial crimes. Uh, he was guilty of financial of, of crimes. Of not just one. Several. Serious stuff. Several. He, he did not kill a restrained uh, what, person what, what on the ground. What teaching are we giving our children? You could be corrupt as long as you're no. a politician no, and Omer, you're a buddy Omer, with yes. the president. What teach, I will fair. give what you clemency. What teaching are we giving our children? That's what How do you teach that's this in teaching. your synagogue? And, and I want that's Omer, teaching we're Omer giving. did suffer. He was in prison. That's what and, we're uh, his career was ruined. I, I'm yeah. we're, on the other side, we're teaching our children run away from the military uh, service because you might be frightened one day because of a terrorist. And you may do no, the wrong we're, thing, we're and you'll a, end up in jail. That a That's what we're teaching. Weapon, and it has to That's be used responsibly. Teaching. I don't. It looked to me like the trial was very fair, and that people took it very seriously. And again, there was the argument: not this guy was a hero; he was a frightened kid, and therefore he should be given some kind of slack. Also, uh, and in the end, the court came out unequivocally: you may not kill a person who's restrained on the ground. Even if he's a, even if unequivocally. he is a terrorist, <laughs> uh, unequivocally. unequivocally, I agree with that. Me, of course, I was proud as it well. It made me proud. I yeah. was absolutely. And, and it says to me, this is what the is, what the IDF is, yeah. and that's and what Rivlin is, stood up for. Yes, and I, and I agree with that, and I agree with that. It's a question of clemency. Question of clemency. And I give him credit. Yeah. And like that, it infuriates me when the BDS movement tries to make the Israeli army out to be monstrous and hideous. What the Israeli army is, what the IDF is, is exactly what happened in that trial. Exactly. Okay. All right. Stephen Bain, for you, who is the Jewish person of the year 2017? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, just one quick footnote. Um, I agree that, uh, with Rabbi Abadi that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, for all the controversy surrounding him, uh, does not get enough credit for the positive achievements that are on his record particularly in terms of Israel's diplo diplomatic relations in places that we would not have expected it, like Asia and Africa. So in that respect, while he's not my person of the year, I do think he, get, he deserves more credit than he currently gets. So would he be on your list somewhere? Oh, yeah, because nothing else, because he's one of the most influential Jews in the world, okay. if not the most influential. Would Rivlin also be on your list? Absolutely. Absolutely. So far, okay. we've got three great, two great choices. Okay. I'm great my choice time. is quite unorthodox. Um, the Jewish person of the year, to me, is Gal Gadot. That's what uh, I was going to say. In other words, popular, <laughs> popular culture is enormously Explain influential. Explain who Gal Gadot is. Gal Gadot played Wonder Woman. Uh, the movie itself has had an incredibly positive impact, especially upon young, ambitious, upwardly climbing women, Jewish women. Uh, so in and of itself, the movie was very, very desirable. The fact that she does so unabashedly as a Jew and as an Israeli made me feel extremely proud. But in terms of uh, being a force for good, popular culture should never be... Uh, underestimated. Well, let me just add to what Steve said, which I, maybe it gives us part A and part B. Yes, it's Gal Gadot, but it wasn't specifically Gadot. It, wasn't, it was the performance that she gave on Saturday Night Live. And for happened. those of you who haven't seen it, it was extraordinary. It was one of the mo most incredible moments in American television history. She walked out on stage to do her monologue and she welcomed the audience and she says, you know, I have a very strange accent. I'm from the country of Israel. Now, myself, given the fact that I tour the country and I speak at places that are hostile to Israel, I immediately cringed. I said, oh, don't tell them that. Don't acknowledge that. She said just what's unabashedly, I'm from Israel. The audience erupted in applause. The word Israel created applause. And I was shocked by this. I said, how can that be? This is New York audience, progressives. Of course, Israel Young. is to blame for everything. And she, here she was, this lovely actress saying, a former Miss Israel, a former uh, soldier in the IDF, right? These are things. She's not just Israeli. She's really Israeli. So she then says this, and then she goes on to say, 
it's a beautiful country. You know, she says, this is the first time that Saturday Night Live is being broadcast live in Israel. And the audience erupted in applause. And I thought, wow, that is an extraordinary thing, that the Israelis are actually watching this live. Whatever time it was, it was during the day, I guess, in that point. So then she wasn't done. She said, because we are watching live in Israel, I hope it's OK that I will speak in Hebrew. And then she spoke in Hebrew with translations. First of all, what was extraordinary was that was the joke. When she spoke in Hebrew, she was telling everyone, it's great to be on this show. You know, it's being an Israeli means everyone asks you if you like hummus. She was making jokes about what it means. But it was the reception that she received to a national audience live and to an in-studio audience in New York City. And that she was so, as Steve said, uh, unabashedly, avowedly Israel. That in fact, being Israeli was part of the material. It was the monologue, right? It's not like uh, you know she was an Israeli actress who we didn't discuss that she was Israeli. It was the joke. And that in fact, even in this time of BDS, even in this time of the normalization of right-wing anti-Semitism, here was a real moment of incredibly, to me, extraordinary hope for, for Jews in America, for Israel's position in the world, that Gal Gadot, who was now being called Wonder Woman from a film, an Israeli actress is now has the tagline Wonder Woman, could have been received this way in the United States on national television in front of a live audience, announcing, speaking Hebrew on television, telling the audience she's from Israel, and telling the audience that her country was watching at this moment. I thought it was one of the times most riveting television I had seen. Uh, this one historical about. footnote while we're on the, uh, the Wonder Woman question. Um, the first Wonder Woman on television was, um, I'm trying to remember her Linda name. Linda Carter. Uh, Linda Carter. She was married to a, uh, uh, a banker by the name of Altman. Altman, yeah. I assume was Jewish. Yeah. Her uh, younger sister on the program. Deborah Winger. Deborah Winger served in the Israeli army. Oh. So the association between Wonder Woman and Israel is actually quite, quite a strong one. With all of the negativity about Israel, if you're looking at the broad American public opinion, right. yeah. Still support for Israel good. remains very, yes, very, very high. high. And that's been the case since 1948. Yes. And again, we, as Jews, we tend to look at the negativity as if the positive sides don't exist. Right. We need to tell a positive story as well, and I think Gal Gadot Absolutely. does it very extremely Absolutely. well. I am very, very frightened about the Jewish future. But when I sit with the four of you, what is instinctive, an instinctive Jewish impulse is to be optimistic. Because if we have people like you who are sensitive, and, you, and I don't even know that you all agree, you don't all agree, you, but it's all a nuance. In essence, there is an agreement about this marvelous, both Jewish and human enterprise and journey we're on. And on behalf of all the viewers, and now we're seeing, again, in many, many more cities and homes all across America, globally online. I want to, on their behalf, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. I am very, 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 very appreciative. You're all wonderful. That's our year-end Jewish retrospective of 2017 with Thane Rosenbaum, Eric Yaffe, Stephen Bame, and Ellie Abadi. As always, I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on what you think is the important Jewish events of the year, whom you'd select as your Jewish person of the year. Please be in touch with me by email, or by writing me, or by posting on our Facebook page, or you may even tweet me. I hope to hear from many of you. And please remember, this is your last opportunity to become part of the JBS family by making a tax-deductible donation to help keep programs like this one on American television. And remember, you have a special opportunity to double the value of your new or increased gift thanks to the generous matching gift from Gloria and Harvey Cayley. You can make your donation online on the JBS website. You can call the JBS pledge line at 800 852-6618, or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS at Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And to all of you who do love JBS, 
and support a quality Jewish educational channel on American television. On behalf of everybody here at JBS, and even on behalf of this panel, our deepest thanks. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub, wishing you all a healthy and happy new calendar year in 2018. L'chaim, my friends, good life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.